Uh, good morning, church. Um, I'm up here pretty excited, um, especially, heavily, especially having listened to those songs. It was like someone had snuck into my bedroom uh, as late as this morning, gone through all my notes and specifically chose songs that, you know, condensed down all my notes and just specifically chose songs in relation to that. Was, I'm excited for what the Lord's going to do this morning. And uh, you'll know what I mean by the end of the sermon. Um, we're back in the book of Habakkuk, so please turn there. Last time we were here in the book of Habakkuk, we were considering responses. Responses to God's revealed will in life. You know, for Habakkuk and the people of Judah, God's revealed will was uh, an imminent invasion by the Babylonians. That's what God had revealed to them. And such was the wickedness of the people of Judah that God chose to raise up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to punish his own people and bring about his judgment on them. So there were some extremely hard times ahead for, for God's people. For us... God's revealed will is revealed day by day. It's revealed first and foremost in his word. There it's plainly there for us to read and to learn from God's revealed will. But God's will is also revealed in what he chooses or what he permits or what he sanctions, however you want to term it. But what we go through in life, that is God's revealed will. Nothing happens to us in life that's outside of God's permissive will, the good and the bad. And our response makes up part of why God causes us to go through what we go through. God uses the circumstances that he brings into our lives to grow us and to develop us in our faith and to conform us into the image of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. So how we individually respond to God's revealed will is critically important. With that in mind, let's look again at uh, the book of Habakkuk, um, chapter 3, and we'll learn a little bit more from how Habakkuk responded to God's revealed will. Habakkuk, chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet according to Shigianoth. Lord, I've heard the report about you and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand. And there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn, Selah. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation, you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. 
You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the house, the head of the house of evil, to lay him open from thigh to neck, Selah. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses, on the surge of many waters. I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet. And makes me walk on my high places for the choir director on my stringed instruments. So, last time we were uh, here in this chat, that we noted two responses of Habakkuk's uh, responses that we should action in our own lives ourselves. And the first was his response of prayer. Um, so respond to God's revealed will in your life with prayer. God reveals his will, and the prophet, uh, he tells the prophet what's ahead, and Habakkuk prays. Always a good response, praying. And in Habakkuk's prayer, which was made into a psalm, a song, the prophet acknowledges God's superiority and his sovereignty, and basically prays, thy will be done. And then ask that in God's wrath he remember mercy. You know, it's a great prayer for all of us to follow ourselves. In those first couple of verses, we also noted a change in the prophet, which led to the second response that we need to action in our own lives. And that was Habakkuk's response of humility. Respond to God's revealed will in your life with humility. You know, Habakkuk had done with his questioning God. He had finished with his accusations of God not hearing his prayers or not doing anything. He had ceased trying to justify in his own mind how God, who he knew to be holy and righteous, could use an even more wicked nation than Judah to, to bring about his will. He had finished with that. And rather, in sincere humility, he, he accepts that God is sovereign, that God knows best, that all that God chooses in life is good and right, and that he is worthy of praise. And for the next dozen or so verses, that's the next response from Habakkuk that we see. And it's the same for us. We ought to respond in this way as well to God's revealed will in our own lives. Respond to God's revealed will in your life with praise. Having given his request to God in prayer, Habakkuk then turns his thoughts to God and to how he has worked in Israel's history in the past. He meditates on who God is and how he has helped his people right throughout their history. And even though Habakkuk knows what the future holds for him and the people of Judah. Thinking about God results in praise. So in verses 3 through to 19, Habakkuk just launches into this praise song as he pictures God's glory and God's presence, God's power, his judgment and his beauty. He praises God in spite of, of what God had revealed is coming. 
He praises God not in response to his circumstances, but in response to he who knows or who he knows God to be. And again, which is a, a right response for all of us um, to God's revealed will in our own lives. Respond to God's revealed will in your own life with praise, because praise is befitting for our God. Worthy is he to be praised. Praise is befitting for him whatever he chooses for us in life because he always does what is right. He always does what is good, even though we might not seem to think it at the time. Anyway, we're going to walk through this text and have a look at it a bit. We read in verse 3 that he says, God comes from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Sila. So God, the... The creator, the Lord of the earth is the Holy One who comes from Timon and Mount Paran. Now, Timon was the name of Esau's grandson and represents the land of Edom, which lay to the east of the kingdom of Judah. And like the sun which rises in the east and shines over the land, Habakkuk pictures God rising from the east and shining over his people. Mount Paran is part of the Sinai mountain ranges, which for the Israelites was a very special place indeed. It's where God revealed himself to his people in a way that he'd never done before. And as he came down upon Mount Sinai, his magnificent glory shone all around. Moses' face for days just literally shone because of that, that meeting on that mountain. God's radiance was even reflected off all the, the neighboring mountains. Moses recalls that event in Deuteronomy chapter 32 where he writes, The Lord came down from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. Seir is another name for Eden. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of, his, of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. And as we've read through that, that chapter 3, Habakkuk, he continues to utilize the imagery of the sun and, and says that God's splendor covers the heavens and earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from, the, from his hand and there is the hiding of his power. You know, God's Glory, the, the brilliance of his grandeur, it just permeates everywhere. It cloaks and transcends the vastness of all the heavens. And the earth just overflows with hymns of praise to him. You think about it, like the, like the strength of the bright beaming midday sun is God's radiance. Power just beams from his side, out from his fingertips. This is what um, theologians call a theophany, um, a manifestation, a visible appearance of, of God. But I love that little phrase at the end of uh, verse 4 there, and there is the hiding of his power. Now, so you've got all these wonderfully vivid descriptions of God's appearance with light like the sun and rays from his hands and fire and smoke and, and radiance. But all that amazing kind of visual stuff hides his real power. All that can be seen is God's radiance and splendor, but God himself is invisible. The real power of the invisible God is himself. It's within himself. He is the source of all that stuff that's visible. Habakkuk continues in verse 5. Before him goes pestilence, and plagues come after him, alluding to, to God delivering his people via the plagues that he brought upon the, the, Egyptians, uh, the Egyptians at the Exodus. Verse 6 says, He stood and surveyed the earth and looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered, the ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. You know, with a, a mere gaze from this mighty God, the whole earth is mapped out. It's measured up and sized up and its inhabitants treble. 
mountains that had existed since creation, ancient hills are reduced to rubble before him with a mere gaze. You know, mountains are pretty awesome, aren't they? I love mountaintop views. Not so fond of the walk that it usually takes to see them, though, but I love the view from the top of the mountain. You know, I'm looking forward to flying down to Wellington at the end of this week with my beautiful bride of almost 25 years. And I'm hoping to see Mount Ruapehu and, and Mount Taranaki and Mount um, Naruhoi, and maybe even cap with snow as, as we're flying over them on the way down and, or on the way back. Your view, the view above them can be, can be pretty awesome. But viewing them right down there on the ground before them as they rise up before you, that could, that could be even better, isn't it? You, know, you get more of a sense of their huge, imposing, immovable permanency as they're right there before you. But here we see a contrast. What to us is something that's permanent and immovable like a mountain, to God is something that can just be brought down to dust with a mere look. And what's actually is forever are his ways and his choices and his actions. His ways are forever. The prophet speaks of seeing the tents of Kashan and Midian under distress and trembling. Um, commentators, are, they differ as to who these people actually were, but most believe that Kushan and Midian uh, were, an ancient, were ancient nomadic tribes that were perhaps witnesses to these manifestations of God um, in and around Mount Sinai at the time. And they shook with fear inside their tents as a result. And all their tents were affected by a seismic activity that occurred when God chose to reveal himself at times. But, you know, it certainly starts to lift the heart a little bit, doesn't it, when we ponder our glorious God. And I think that's the intention of these verses. You know, to take the focus off current circumstances and onto the, to the one true living God who rules in power over all circumstances. God, through the prophet Habakkuk, wants people to know the same glorious God that delivered his people from the Egyptians, whose presence was seen at Mount Sinai, who traveled and watched over his people on their journeys through the wilderness, still moves in surpassing brilliance ahead of his people today. We need to remember that. Back to our text, in verse 8, the prophet asked God a metaphorical question as to the motive behind his coming. Why did he come? Habakkuk answers this, this himself in verse 13, where he says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. He considers what it was that made the Lord vent his wrath against the rivers and the seas, and caused them to ride on his horse-driven chariot of salvation. Again, a, a metaphorical question alluding to the striking of the Nile, turning the water to the blood, the parting of the Red Sea to escape the pursuing Egyptians, and the parting of the River Jordan so that God's people could enter the promised land. I was kind of hoping God might strike the waters out the front of our building this morning so that we would come in, but maybe he will. But, you know, throughout this whole section, God is portrayed metaphorically. He's, he's depicted as Israel's mighty warrior, as a hero redeemer who approaches in his battle chariot and he's armed to the teeth, ready for battle. We read that he's armed with a bow in verse 9. We read that he has clubs or rods. Again, in verse 9, he's equipped with arrows in verse 11. And he has a spear also in, in verse 11 as well. God arrives ready to battle, ready for a fight. Now, what a warrior to have on your side when you're facing an enemy. I like the one that was bearing down on Judah at the time. Verse 11 praises God for showing his power over the sun and the moon a reference to when he caused the sun and the moon to stand still 
at the battle of Gibeon against the Amorites in Joshua 10, verses 12 to 14. In all, Habakkuk, he just, he just praises God as Israel's heroic redeemer who has power and control over all the natural elements of creation, the rivers, the seas, the whole earth, mountains and storms, the sun, the moon, and all the nations of the wicked. He's in control. He has power over them. They are all nothing before almighty Lord God of the universe. And he will effortlessly use them and even destroy them if necessary in defense of his chosen people. Wouldn't that encourage you as you know that an enemy is bearing down upon you? It's a comforting thought. Comforting if you know that this God described here is for you and not against you. Yeah, but what a transition. What a transition from what we first heard from the prophet in chapter 1. You know, he's gone from please to praise, from worry to worship, from gloom to glory. He's transitioned from crying out to God in, in sorrow and frustration to singing out to God in joy and confidence. He's shifted from perplexed about what God isn't doing to praising God for what he has done and what he will do. And it's not because God told him, hey, don't worry about it, everything's going to be fine. No. Instead, Habakkuk, he's had an absolute bombshell dropped on him. You know, he's just been informed that the people that he cared about so much that he was praying for are about to be overthrown by a notoriously cruel enemy, a brutal army. All manner of death and destruction, agony and atrocities lay ahead for them. And now he's praising God. You know, it's not that he's trivializing the situation. He wasn't ignoring the pain and suffering that he and the people of, of Judah are about to endure. Instead, he focuses on who he knows his God to be. He meditates on the power of God and the love that God has shown for his people in the past, and he praises him for it. So do we praise God even when he reveals to us that we're in for difficult times. When the darkness closes in, do we say, Lord, blessed be your name? Habakkuk knew that God is good all the time, despite the circumstances. He knew that God keeps his covenant promises and would never turn his back on his people. He always came to their rescue when they repented and they called on his name. He had been told and he believed that the righteous would live by faith. And this leads him to affirm his trust and his faith in God. Which brings me to the last point I want to highlight from this, this chapter this morning. Respond to God's revealed will in your life with faith. Verse 16 tells us Habakkuk hadn't forgotten about what lay in store for his people, for the people of Judah, nor had he expected to be totally spared from the misery himself. He writes in verse 16, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound my lips quivered, decay enters my bones. And in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress. For the people to arise who will invade us. Yeah, you know, Habakkuk, he doesn't uh, doesn't hide the fact that he's concerned about things. He's certainly in anguish about what was in store in the near future, and that's understandable in light of of what was coming. I mean, who here wouldn't be if if they were in his place? But what was coming didn't cause him to deny his faith. It didn't cause him to give up on God and say, oh, well, we're all doomed. You know, God had told him that the righteous will live by faith. Now, I'm not sure if, if Habakkuk took, took this to mean guaranteed survival. I think at this stage, he was, he was looking at a bigger picture. 
a picture with a, an eternal perspective, perhaps. Though they die, yet they will live, kind of thing. Anyway, he writes those beautiful, powerful words of personal affirmation and resolve in verse 17 through to 19. Let's read them again. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the, the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places. Despite what happened in the days ahead, Habakkuk resolved to, to trust the Lord. That was his determination. Despite the circumstances around him, he would continue to live by faith. Fig trees, the fruit of the vine, you know, grapes, etc., olives... They're all the chief products of Palestine. Fields, the, the corn, the wheat fields. Flocks and cattle that gave them meat and dairy. You know, if all these were taken away, which almost always happened when a huge marauding army came in and invaded, Habakkuk would remain committed to his God. Is our faith as committed as this? something we should all be asking ourselves. The prophet's faith, his joy, his strength, his security, his confidence wasn't determined by the circumstances around him. It wasn't based on his provision or his well-being or his wealth or in his accomplishments. His faith, his joy, his strength, his securities and confidence, it was based on and rooted in the God of his salvation on that solid rock is ours. Habakkuk committed to living by faith in his Lord and Savior no matter what. And that's the, the point of this whole chapter. And we all need to do the same. Because I'm sure we all know that life is full of uncertainty, isn't it? And the only way to live in this life with any real confidence, with any deep-seated assurance and peace, is to place your confidence in the one true living God, the God that he's just described here in this chapter. So ask yourself, is your life ruled by circumstances, or is it ruled by the one who rules over circumstances? The course of every single event that happens in this universe is within the act of control of the one true living almighty God and the only way to truly live in this world is to place your trust in him to bow in humility and submit your life to the creator of life Habakkuk believed God to be an almighty divine warrior who comes to the aid of his people and saves them do you believe God to be the same for you? Is he your divine warrior who has proven himself worthy of praise because of what he's done in your life? Well, he needs to be if he's not. Now, we might not have an enemy nation like the Babylonians bearing down on us, but we do have a ferocious enemy who walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is an adversary more cruel and more dangerous than any human enemy. And the Bible tells us if we're not safely sheltered in the arms of the divine warrior Jesus Christ, then we're lost. We're not as good as dead, we're dead already. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Another hopeless soul fallen prey to the father of lies, the devil. Now praise be to God because he sent his only begotten son so that we may have life in him. 
Christ, the valiant warrior, laid down his life so that we might live. He gave his sinless life as a sacrifice for us on the cross. As we heard this morning, holy God poured out his righteous wrath against the sin of all who have put their trust in Christ as their Lord and their Savior. He died so that we might have life, real life, liberated life, victorious life, eternal life. And on the third day, Christ rose again, proving that he was victorious over sin and death, proving that the cost for our sin had been met, the price had been paid in full. The divine warrior Jesus Christ has won the victory. And in him alone, we can have victory over sin and death as well. (laughs) By God's grace, through faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can share in his victory. We turn from our sin and trust in Christ. Our faith is in him. If our faith is in him and his redemptive work on the cross, then our sin is removed and we are given Christ's righteousness. By faith, we shall live by faith. You know, God is ever moving forward in his redemptive plan in this world, and he will bring all creation to that glorious coming day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. When all, when the almighty warrior comes for his people, when that day comes, will you be ready? Will you be able to respond with praise because you responded with committed faith? Or will you cower and shake as all his enemies do as they await their judgment? Respond rightly. Respond as Habakkuk responded, with prayer, with humility, with praise, and with committed faith. I hope and pray that we are all ready for when that time comes. So there's no more questions from the prophet Habakkuk. There's no more crying out, why aren't you doing anything, God, in this circumstance? In the end, Habakkuk, he committed to living by faith in his Lord and his Saviour. His faith, his joy, his strength, his security and confidence was in the power and in the love and in the goodness and in the faithfulness of the one true living God. He committed to living by faith in the Lord no matter what. And as we walk along in our own path in life, with all its twists and turns, with all its ups and downs, May we do so as well. Let's pray. Father, every time I preach your word, I have to thank you for it. Lord, it is a book that you have given us to encourage us in the faith. Lord, to call us to faith and repentance. To show us the way to eternal life and, Lord, to to lead us on. Lord, we thank you for your revealed will and your word. And Father, as we walk um, the path of life, help us to walk in that path of faith, Lord, guided by your word. As your revealed will is revealed to us day by day through circumstances, Lord, help us to respond rightly. Help us to remember you, the God of the Bible, and how you care for your people. Help us to, to praise you and to walk on committed to faith in you. We thank you, Lord Jesus.